here at Western, um, jointly appointed between the Faculty of Law and uh, the Faculty of Information and Media Studies. Um, he's, his uh, research and his teaching focuses on information policy issues, uh, particularly copyright. Uh, he's a frequent speaker on copyright issues uh, and is the co-author of Canadian Copyright, a Citizen's Guide, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, he has been uh, a law librarian uh, at UC Berkeley as well as uh, he has practiced law privately and uh, he has uh, currently, or in 2007 and 2008, he's a faculty scholar in residence at the Canadian Association of University Teachers in Ottawa and he's also a member of the Copyright Working Group of the Canadian Library Association. Um, he also maintains a website, samtrousseau.ca, where he, which he keeps updated on copyright uh, issues. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sam today. Thank you very much. Um, as, as you will hear, my voice is gone, and I asked for a microphone. <clears throat> so I'm just going to do the best I can, and my slides are notoriously rude. And so I think if I just really get too far under control, I'll um, I'll just I'll just stop and let the slides go. And some of you have heard my presentation before, so maybe one of you can um, come in. I I, I do want to make some uh, very very specific observations towards the end of my presentation, though, about the state of copyright here at Western, and provide some recommendations for how we can move forward. Um, I also told Adrian that um, I'd be very happy to go into his office and redo the tape with a voiceover. So the one that's going to be preserved on your very excellent website will be um, a little less, uh, little less raspy and, and froggy. But um, anyway, uh, copyrights, it's an issue of growing importance for academics, uh, especially in libraries, teaching, research. Copyright has really, over the last couple of years, gone from a very sort of arcane area of the law that was in, uh, of interest only to specialists to something that is really not only in the center of the academy, but increasingly becoming in the center of uh, all of society. I think one of the reasons for this is <clears throat> some of the old dichotomies between creators on the one hand and users on the other hand are breaking down in light of some of the new developments in technology where people are able to, without a whole lot of money and without a, without a whole lot of background, are able to obtain technology that allows them to do the types of really creative, transformative new works in the areas of music, literature, art, scholarship, all sorts of cultural production that in the past, printing, publishing, that in the past required huge entry costs and created sort of this uh, dichotomy between information industries that were necessary in order to sort of um, distribute the, uh, the, the collective, collective knowledge of society and, and end users. So I think it's a mistake at the beginning to fall into this trap that the information industries and those that support them are trying to lay for us. And that is the new technology needs to be controlled because of the evil potential of all the downloading that can go on. Um, you know, the, the, the whining and the hand-wringing about the evil impacts of new technology is nothing new. This has been going on, it's been going on for centuries with the printing press, with the piano roll, with the photocopy machine, and now, of course, with the, with the computer. It's nothing new. We're constantly reminded how the music is going to stop, how publishing is going to be shut down. The piano roll was going to put the music industry out of business, as it was known. And we're told the same thing about digital technology. And we should never forget it for a minute, the, 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 the ability of digital technology to empower masses of people to do things that they just really, they were able to do before, but they didn't have the ability to do it in such a way that it could get to the public so quickly and so effectively. And that's really what underlines my talk. The other theme that underlines my talk, and I'm so pleased to be sponsored by the Western Libraries here. The other theme that underlines my talk is <coughs> the importance of libraries as an institution in terms of promoting fair copyright practices and broad, broad access principles, and how absolutely essential it is that libraries retain the jurisdiction in their spheres of influence to deal with copyright policy 
because there are many people out there that think they know better than librarians do in terms of how people go about using information, and they don't. And that goes for even us professors, it goes for a lot of lawyers, it goes for publishers, and it goes for people who want to set the rules of access. But in the end, it's the librarians and people who work in information resources, teaching, learning, research, who understand in the end how important it is to have an unimpeded system of uh, access. <clears throat> I want to briefly talk about an overview of copyright law. I'm going to do that very quickly. Um, I'm going to focus on the owner's exclusive rights, mostly the reproduction right. And then I'm going to focus quite a bit on fair dealing. Because I think fair dealing is a, is a relatively new development in Canadian copyright law. And it's of, it, it's of, it's of extreme importance. Without fair dealing, we don't really have a lot of rights to do many of the things that we as students, teachers, librarians, learners, researchers need to do. Fair dealing has been expanded quite a bit in the last few years. And unfortunately, our institutions have been very slow to keep up with these changes. In fact, in many ways, our institutions sometimes are fighting a battle against the proper implementation of fair dealing because fair dealing is messy. Fair dealing involves everybody getting involved. And fair dealing is a very, very sort of users-based, democratic, bottoms-up enterprise that everybody has to take the challenge to be involved in. And that's messy. And a lot of people just don't want that to happen. And fair dealing gets shut down. And I'm going to talk about the access copyright license. Because access copyright is the institution in Canada that in my view is very much responsible, although not solely responsible, for trying to shut down the spread and the development of fair copyright practices throughout Canada. <clears throat> so some of the threats to impediments, impediments to access and equity concerns, overly aggressive enforcement by rights holders. <coughs> We've certainly seen this in the United States much more so than in Canada. And hopefully we'll never see it in Canada to the level that we've seen it in the United States, where you have teenagers and grandparents and people living in projects being sued for lots of money, money they don't have, for things that just go on in everyday life. And when you go to the computer store and buy a system, when you sign up with your internet service provider, these are not people you're meeting in the dark back alley. These are legitimate transactions. We have a very vibrant electronics industry here in Canada. We have a very vibrant retail sector in Canada. We have a very vibrant group, perhaps a little too vibrant sometimes, of internet service providers who are doing very, very well, perhaps a little too well. But we have some very, very vibrant sectors here, and they all share something in common. They want people to be able to go online and do what people naturally want to do online. And what is it that people naturally want to do? They want to, be they want to be creative. They want to engage with information resources. They don't want to steal other people's words. They don't want to be pirates. But for the most part, they want to be able to just go about their lives and enjoy the products that they've lawfully purchased without fear of the knock on the door coming from enforcement agents, telling them that something came down on their computer and their internet service provider has turned their name over to the content owners so they can be faced with life, sort of like career-threatening kind of uh, lawsuits like we've seen in the United States. The uncertainty in the current law, though, breeds a certain amount of chill. People are really afraid in many ways to use the rights that they have under the law. <clears throat> they're afraid to use the rights because they don't understand that if they're, the likelihood of them being sued is small, that even if they are, they've got a number of justifications in defense. That in Canada, unlike the United States, there are very strong privacy laws that will protect Canadian data subjects from the types of um, unreasonable disclosures that we saw happen in the United States, where privacy laws are lacking, certainly not to the level that we enjoy here in Canada. Um, the specter of even more onerous laws is another threat. Bill C-61 was a great example, bringing the DMCA to Canada in its worst forms. 
without at the same time looking at some of the good features of American copyright law. And um, as an American citizen, I always say that sometimes the Americans get things right. It's too easy to just say, well, it's American, it's wrong. Sometimes the Americans get things right. They certainly got it right with Crown copyright. Works of the US government, there's no copyright. It's not a question of it being a defense or a license. It just doesn't subsist in the first place. And certainly open-ended fair use. You don't have to fit into one of the characters. You don't have to fit into one of the buckets of fair dealing like you do here in Canada. So they get it right sometimes, but they also get it wrong. And when they get it wrong, they really get it wrong. And the DMCA, which unfortunately I don't have time to talk about today, but the DMCA is just a great example of them really getting it wrong. And even the main proponents of the DMCA, Bruce Lehman, who was Clinton's point person on the copyright file, has since admitted they were wrong. They didn't know what they were doing. They thought they were doing the right thing because it just seemed in the mid-90s that there was this impending pressure to do something about this emerging technology. They didn't understand the technology at the time. And they had some very ill-considered laws that went through Congress, not because of good congressional policy making, but because people were pressured because of the imperatives Congress people were told of international agreements that we must enter without really questioning why, without really questioning what happens if we don't? <coughs> what happens if we don't implement WIPO? These questions that the United States failed to answer over a dozen years ago are questions that Canadian policymakers are still asking. And that's good for Canada. That's not bad for Canada. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. <clears throat> Another way that copyright can become an impediment to teaching, learning, cultural production, etc is risk-averse institutions. Risk-averse risk averse institutions that do not really understand or understand but are not willing to acknowledge that the current state of the law is very different than it was eight years ago. It's changed. And that with that change comes responsibility for institutions to sort of not just do the easy thing because there are powerful interests saying you better do what we want otherwise we're going to come around and audit you, maybe, maybe sue you. Risk-averse institutions need to understand the needs of all the constituents. Institutions can be universities, they can be libraries. Copyright policy is not just made at the federal level. Copyright policy is made everywhere. Doesn't matter what federal copyright policy is. If your institution has such a bad policy on fair dealing that you don't get to enjoy it. So copyright policy it's happening every place. And finally, lack of public awareness about users' rights and exceptions to infringement. <clears throat> I'm going to go through these slides really quickly. These will be available for you um, later. I think I've talked about some of these changes, but um, one of the things that the new technologies do is really threaten old business models. And when old business models get threatened, they often react in poor ways like the movie industry did in the 1980s when they tried shutting down the VCR in its infancy. And they came within one vote on the Supreme Court of succeeding. If one vote on the Supreme Court had shifted in the Sony case, they would have had an injunction. And the retailers would have had to have pulled uh, the, the predecessors of VCRs off the shelf. So they were able to convince the courts they had rights. Fortunately, Fair use prevailed over that, but it was close. And you know, the same, the same industries that just were so worried about it ended up doing very well in the end. <clears throat> anyway, um, these tools for creativity, transform transformativity, transfor transformativity are not only more diffused and more available, but they equal the playing field. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to focus on the work. Copyright protects a couple of different types of interests. But in Canada, let's just focus on the work. Section 3 of the Copyright Act basically says, basically says, and this is, this is a terrible sentence, but it says, copyright in relation to a work means the sole right to produce or reproduce the work or any substantial part thereof in any material form whatever. And it should stop there. <clears throat> 
and then there should be a new subparagraph. And it should say, B, to perform the work or any substantial part thereof. Let's just focus on that first part. That's the reproduction right. That's the heart of copyright. That's the exclusive right of the owners to make copies. Now, sole right is so important. Because what sole right means is <coughs> the Copyright Act gives this sole right to the owner, not to the author, to the owner. And that means only the owner has the right to do it. No one else in the world has a right to do what only the owner has a sole right to do. And that includes not just producing the entire work, but producing any substantial part of the work. And that is a very broad monopoly right that the state has given to copyright owners. And if that were the end of it, we'd all be in very serious trouble. And we'd be grasping for straws to save us, like access copyright agreements. But fortunately, that's not the end of it. That's just one half of the equation. This is the half of the equation that says what the owner's rights are. It is impossible, if you are working in an information-intensive environment, to go through a normal work day without committing numerous and egregious acts of technical copyright infringement based on the, just that first part, without, getting, without even getting into whether you're performing stuff. You can't do it. Unless you are working in a highly abstract and, and very, very sort of creative, abstract type of art, music, when you're not using things that other people have done, you cannot exist in terms of your production, in terms of your research output, in terms of your scholarly contributions to this university, which you're, if you're a faculty member, you're under the compulsion to do, because it's your job. If you're a student, that's what you're here to be doing. You better do it. And if you're a librarian, your job here is to facilitate all of that happening. Maybe some, create some initial re, in the individual research on your own. But you cannot engage in these types of activities without engaging with other people's intellectual property. Unless, of course, you're just dealing with really, really old things that are out of copyright. But even then, there are challenges. Because even in the case of uh, people who are dealing with works that are out of copyright, there's always a publisher who's got the claim, well, this compilation is really in comp copyright because we've arranged it differently. So you, you, you really can't be copying this. You can't be putting this version of Plato on web pages because we own some sort of copyright in it. Just look in the books, you'll see copyright notices. This is section three, very important. There are these other rights, which I don't have time to go into. Um, one, that, one that's really important these days is F, to communicate the work to the public by telecommunication. So that would include things like uploading a file to the internet. That would include things like sending out multiple fax transmissions, um, sending out multiple um, phone messages with, with, the same, with the same material on it and to authorize any such act. Think of these acts as separable sticks in a bundle. Every one of these things can be separately peeled apart and transferred away to somebody else. <clears throat> this sole right is so important, it's a monopoly. But there are limits on it. Now, people often ask, what is copyright infringement? This is what the act says. It's a very unhelpful circular decision, uh, definition. It's an infringement to do without the consent of the owner. Anything that by this act only the owner has the right to do. Doesn't mean much without referring back to the substantive section. So in the case of works, you go back to section three. Now, what's really useful here is the word consent. What does consent mean? Lots of times, you already have the consent, either express or implied, from an owner to do things. The problem with copyright law is there are too many people who just know a little bit about copyright law. They know enough about copyright law to tell you, you know, you shouldn't copy that because that would be an infringement of copyright. And that's where it stops. And you've got to keep going. You've got to ask, number one, is there consent? Because if there's consent, that vitiates the infringement in the first place. You've seen these 
you see these showing up on internet sites. I think when someone puts like email logo on an internet site, they're sort of indicating that it's okay for you to email it to somebody. So I don't even think that's implied consent. I think that's express consent. You see a lot of things like that. <coughs> print page. What's that mean? It means go ahead and print the page. Press this button. Not only that, not only that, but on, on, on Macs and Windows machines, you've got this interface that has commands at the top like save, um, send to, and on the edit file you've got copy, paste, and my favorite, select all, where you don't even, you don't even discriminate between the different things on the page. You just sort of select the whole thing. Presumably then to paste it someplace else. I don't know a lot of people that use the select all command if it's not followed by a paste command um, someplace. So anybody that posts things on the internet these days understands what's involved. And there are ways that they can limit your ability to do these things. And if they choose not to, you have to assume there's a little bit of consent there. And you see this overhead project projection. Everyone understands what's involved with that. Because if something's available on the internet, to be shown to a huge classroom. Everyone knows that. So you have to take this word consent and give it some reasonable and give it some reasonable me meaning. You just can't be in this little shell that says, oh, I don't have this sort of like signed, sealed statement with the wax signet and everything that says, you may use this. It's not within the terms of the access copyright license or something. Um, you have to think a little bit about what the scope of consent is. Um, Here's an example of consent. The university enters into a site license with a, with a, with a vendor to provide a run of electronic journals. <coughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's good. Let's move that from the tape. Um, everybody on campus has the ability, everybody who comes in from a campus IP address has the ability to access that, presumably print out a copy. They've usually done something nasty to make the PDF like messy or something, so you don't print a lot of them out. But presumably, you all, you all have the right to do that. Why would somebody put that in a course, in a course reader, and then have the bookstore access, access some um, fees to send to access copyright on a per page basis? You've already bought the consent. Why would we do that? Why don't we make sure that doesn't happen? So to review up to the point of infringement, has one of the Section 3 rights been implicated? Has there been a reproduction or performance of a substantial part? Was there consent? <coughs> Even if there wasn't, there are numerous exceptions to infringement. The most important one that I'm going to talk about today is fair dealing. And in fact, there are many other ones too. And prior to 2004, 2002, fair dealing was not that strong. And there was a feeling in the library and education community that we really had to rely on some of these other special education and library exceptions that were brought into uh, the law in 1997. These were really forward-thinking ones. The ability to do things on dry flip charts, eraser boards, uh, those, types of, those types of things. Um, been a long time since 1997. And um, I think the nice thing about fair dealing is as the government as the government says in their um, question, in their consultation, does it stand the test of time? These technology-specific amendments, these institution-specific amendments often become stale as technologies change or the way people go about utilizing institutions change. But a fluid, open-ended, fair dealing, which I'm going to articulate, stands the test of time. And it's a far superior way to go about organizing or thinking about how we can get over what would otherwise be a very onerous copyright monopoly. So basically, Section 29 says, fair dealing for purpose of research or private study does not infringe copyright. Same 29.1 with respect to criticism or review, providing certain criteria are met, attributions. Same for 29.2 with respect to news reporting. Historically, the courts have been very strict in interpreting what constitutes research, private study, 
criticism, and review. Because these categories stood in derogation to a property right. And it was felt that the primary purpose of the copyright the interest of copyright owners. Notice I never said authors here. Copyright owners. Because for, for a variety of reasons, which is a whole other talk in itself, the copyright author is often not the owner. There actually, there's actually some material that's been produced about retaining ownership of your copyright. A whole, whole other discussion. But this started to change this century, just recently. And it was the CCH case, the unanimous Supreme Court case, that said, we really can't take research and give it a limited application. We have to give it a broad, liberal interpretation. Because fair dealing is not just a technical defense to copyright infringement, said the court. Fair dealing is an integral and important part of the Copyright Act. And users' rights have to be balanced with owners' rights. They're just as important. This was shocking news to people, because that's not the way Canadian copyright was. A lot of people who have been, I'm sort of lucky in that <coughs> I came to Canadian copyright study rather late. I was in the United States until 2001. So I didn't start studying Canadian copyright until things really started to change. And I really picked up my study of Canadian copyright at the time when things were just turning around. So it was very easy for me. And I understand a lot of my colleagues in the legal profession who have been looking at copyright issues for a long time are having difficulty with this. Because what the Supreme Court started saying in 2002, <coughs> excessive control by holders of copyrights and other forms of intellectual property may unduly limit the ability of the public domain to incorporate and embellish creative innovation. This was very strange stuff. Now this was a split Supreme Court and a decision that didn't have anything to do with a fair dealing. But it foreshadowed what was happening and it foreshadowed what the court was going to say two years later in CCH. And in CCH the court said, fair dealing has to be thought of as an integral part of the Copyright Act, not just as a technical defense. And users' rights are not just loopholes. The Supreme Court also said, because there's some question here about, since there's special library and education exceptions, whether you can resort to fair dealing. The court said, Section 29 is always available to a library. The library does not have to even worry about the special library exceptions unless it can't make out fair dealing. <coughs> the other thing the Supreme Court did in CCH was even though it's not part of the act. They adapted a list of factors that came from the earlier decisions. The purpose of the dealing, the character of the dealing, the amount of the dealing, the alternatives to the dealing, the nature of the work, and the effect of the dealing on the work. But not one of these is more important than the other. You look at all of them. In the United States, we have something similar. We have four factors. But in the United States, the fourth factor has become more important than the other ones. The economic effect, the effect of the use on the economic rights of the owner. And Canadian courts have been very, very clear to avoid <coughs> that type of privileging of one factor over others. And in fact, um, the court made it very clear that there's certain things that you're supposed to consider. One of which, which really is important for us, is the customer practice in a particular trade or industry to determine whether the character of the dealing is fair. When you have major universities post things on their website that essentially say there's no fair dealing, always get permission. That's not just wrong. It hurts. And it's in derogation of everyone else's fair dealing rights because it forms part of a customer practice. When you have national associations National Education Associations make the claim in their lobbying that fair dealing doesn't protect what we do in the classroom. We need special educational exceptions. That may or may not be right. I don't think it is. It's a question of opinion. But it hurts when it's said in such 
extreme terms, as groups like CMAC and AACC have done, because that helps create a very bad custom and practice in the industry. My worry is that all of the good language that's in CCH <coughs> is going to be for nothing if we continue along the lines of what we're doing in terms of not using it and denying that it's there. Because we are creating a bad record, a bad custom and practice. So when risk-averse institutions say, well, you know, we're just going to go along with access copyright on this because we just don't want any trouble. They're doing more than taking money from their students in situations they don't have to. They're creating a very bad set of custom and practices that is going to come back and bite them someday. It's time for them to stop. One of the main differences between fair use analysis in the United States and fair dealing analysis in Canada, well, in its favor, fair use is open-ended, such as, including classroom use. That's good. But the case law in the United States has been very clear that in determining the fourth factor, economic effect on the work, you can take into effect if a license is available and you're claiming fair use. You claiming fair use is not going to have a negative effect on the market for the license. American courts have said that's okay. Over objections that it's circular. Circular because if you allow the owners of the licensed material to say, we're going to make a license available, therefore you can't use fair dealing. That's circular because you allow the owners to sort of wish away fair use, which they've been able to do in many, many situations in the United States. Paragraph 70 of CCH is very important. <coughs> the availability of a license is not relevant. I'm not going to read the whole thing. In fact, read along quietly for a second and catch my breath. They got it. They just got it. They got something the American courts have not been able to get. This is a very powerful statement. The fact that an access copyright license is available does not destroy your ability to claim fair dealing. I think when the court uses words like is not relevant, they understand what they're saying. And that was the unanimous Supreme Court. And sometimes Canadians have a more difficult time with this than Americans. But the Supreme Court's the highest court in the land. And they're the arbiter of what's legal and what's not. And I know that there are a lot of people that don't like that because there are different views of what constitutes proper judicial review with respect to the acts of parliament and the crown. And it may be a very, it may be a very American concept to start saying that we've now, we've now got strong rights-based courts who are going to do things like make determinations about what people's rights are. But we're living in the charter era, and that's what the Supreme Court does. And I know that CCH bothers a lot of people because people from Access Copyright have told me, Sam, you just you pay too much attention to CCH. It was, a, it was just a dispute between two parties. It was just one case. You're blowing it all out of proportion. It just had to do with that case. And I'm like, no, I think it was a Supreme Court decision. So we have a difference of opinion about what the effect of judicial review in the Canada is. Um, anyway, the other point I want to sort of close on before I go on to some recommendations is in the CCH case, which dealt with a library, a law library that was, that was providing document delivery services to lawyers, private lawyers, even private lawyers who apparently were not really being engaged in a lot of pro bono work and things like that, if I understand what goes on at the firms. But um, even they were, were, were able to take advantage of um, fair dealing. Nature of, the, nature of these. The fact that it was commercial didn't totally knock it out like the publishers wanted it to. It's a factor that would be taken into account. Maybe you'd be able to do more if it was for a nonprofit or educational use. But the fact that it was for profit lawyers um, didn't knock them out of the way. The, uh, the Great Library had a policy, and it said, if it looks like any order is just 
going behind fair dealing, we're going to have a librarian look at it, a reference librarian. Not a lawyer, not a publisher, a librarian. And the Supreme Court endorsed it unanimously. And what the Supreme Court did in that paragraph was they said, you know, we think that it's librarians that have the professional expertise to be making these decisions. Because they gave effect to that clause. And as a result of that clause, the Supreme Court was, was willing to say, this is not just fair dealing in this particular situation. This is fair dealing across the board because of this policy. Very significant. They went further than the Court of Appeal was willing to go. Librarians have to understand that the scope of their jurisdiction has been expanded by a very, very, very generous Supreme Court decision. And they really should start using it. Because um, it's just amazing what the Supreme Court did. They really recognized that it's the librarians that understand how this stuff works. Not necessarily the lawyers. Which doesn't mean that you can't be both. But it's, it's the librarians that get to make this decision. And what that means for me is when you go back to your own institutions, who's, who's calling the shots? Who's making it? Who, decide what, who decides what happens and what doesn't. And I think there's somewhat of a disconnect between the power realities of some of our institutions, most of our institutions, and um, the, 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 the potential of the language in the CCH decision. So, you, know, you divide the world into copyright, no copyright, but that yellow circle is just so subject to being chipped away by fair dealing, by non-copyrightable elements in copyright, in copyrighted compilations, which would take me a little while to explain in full, but data is not copyrighted. But you can have collections of data that on the whole are copyrighted. And certainly copyright expires in work center of the public domain. So this, this yellow circle it's constantly changing, it constantly gets chipped away. So to have a one-size-fits-all rule that says you have to pay per use, it doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't take into account the reality of modern copyright law. <clears throat> what is the relationship between the access copyright license and fair dealing provisions? Well, the two are designed to coexist. A little known fact, the two are designed to coexist. Many people think that the access copyright license has superseded somehow fair dealing. But it doesn't. The preamble to the access copyright UWO license, and by the way, there's nothing special about this license. It's the same license that's been negotiated centrally by AUCC for all the universities. So the blame here is not on the council of any particular university. The blame here is central. But then again, this contract was negotiated prior to CCH. So I'm not sure there's a lot of blame. Pre-CCH, I could see why people thought that access copyright protection was more important. What does the access copyright license buy you, by the way? Very roughly. I think what the access copyright license gets you is if you stay within the terms of the access copyright license, you are contractually being indemnified. You're being told it's okay. It's in an oversimplified way. It's like you're purchasing consent. So you don't have to deal with fair dealing. Stay within the access copyright license. You don't have to deal with messy fair dealing. If you're not within the access copyright license and you're constituted, what you're doing is infringement, which it might be. That's okay. You still may be protected by fair dealing. Um, Whereas the institution desires to continue to secure the right to reproduce copyrighted works, which reproductions would be outside the scope of fair dealing. Yeah, sometimes you need fair dealing plus. And whereas the parties do not agree on the scope of said fair dealing, which was quite understandable when this was negotiated as it was constantly in a state of flux. They still don't agree on it. what it says. This is what it says in every university contract. And then, the exclusions. This agreement does not cover 
any fair dealing with any work for the purposes of private study, criticism, research. It's excluded. It's just excluded. And then, number four, somebody's making representations about whether or not something is or is not an infringement. Just, just nice CYA language. Maybe infringement to do that, it may not. They weren't going to work that out in this contract. Um, so when you really look at what's in the contract itself, some of the things that some universities have put on their website start to look kind of silly. The worst one I've found is at Simon Fraser. It is plainly not fair dealing to use material which is expressly prohibited by a use or copyright statement. Accompanying the material, published website, or printed format. Fair dealing is by necessity. Fair dealing is by definition. Using something without permission. If you had permission, you wouldn't have to talk about fair dealing. If you had permission, you'd have consent, and fair dealing would not be an issue. Because there wouldn't be a prima facie case of infringement for you to have to fair dealing your way out. So don't let anyone ever tell you you can't use fair dealing because the owner said you can. And I don't care what, what it says. And the publishers are going to put it in every book. Yes, even this one, as, as one of the access copyright reps read out in the conference. Sam, can I borrow your book? Sure. Well, your book says blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they all, they all say that. Um, this is wrong. But it's, it's, it, what bothers me about this is the way it's so smugly stated. So it's not just wrong, it's egregiously wrong. Whereas this is just wrong. If you want to make copies of materials not covered by the access copyright license, and the material's not in the public domain, permission must be obtained. That's wrong. That's right with respect to staying within the terms of the access copyright license. But it's wrong with respect to the overall law. Still on the library webpage. Still there. And they know it's wrong. No one's willing to argue with me that it's right. But it's there. Why? I don't know. It's better now because they have some other pages up that have some language on it that's not as wrong. You gotta read them all together and figure out what they're really saying. So it's much better than it was when it just said this. It's improving. And by the way, I don't play the librarians at all. Because I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think that um, under, under all the circumstances, they necessarily have control of their professional practices the way they have to, the way they have to reassert. So, recommendation. I'm not just going to stand up here and complain. What would I recommend? Well, <clears throat> copyright information, and by the way, Western is in great company here. Western statement is based on York's, which is based on other ones. Western is not an outlier here. Western is very typical. Western is very typical of the kind of misinformation that's on copyright web pages. So you're an excellent company. You, we, where we generally. Copyright information has to be a more accurate relationship between fair dealing and the access copyright license. The pages need to be redone. Um, the library needs to rise to the CCH challenge. The whole university needs to rise to the CCH challenge. Not just to reflect the law, but also in terms of reflecting the actual scope and expertise and jurisdiction of the professional librarians. Um, Calgary, UNB are, are just two examples of um, much better websites. And um, I would also suggest making better use of resources from Cal, especially the um, Fair Dealing uh, Advisory. In order to really be compliant with CCH and take advantage of CCH, we need as institutions to start developing our own guides in terms of what constitutes Fair Dealing. That needs to rise from the bottom up. And, that's, and that's, what the, uh, that's what the challenge is. So I think that's more than enough of me sort of uh, talking with my voice. And I'm going to turn it over to questions and comments. And uh, 
father wrote his um, eyewitness, he wrote down his eyewitness account of the Armenian genocide during the 1950s and 15s. And he wrote it in 19, well, the early 1930s and the early 1940s. And it was in the early 1940s published in a Boston newspaper in, in, a, in a serial form, 200 issues of it. I have had that work translated. I want to publish it in English. I have tried to get a hold of the Boston newspaper. I don't think my father was ever paid for it. He did not work for the newspaper. And um, I've tried to contact the Boston newspaper. They don't answer. They, they don't, they don't, uh, they simply don't reply to me. Um, I'm wondering if I do, if I hold copyright. My father died in 1954. Without, without having the benefit of understanding what the arrangement was, I couldn't possibly answer. Yeah, so, however, yeah, I don't know however, what the arrangement was. What you've got to do, really, is say to yourself, what are the risks involved in me doing what I want to do with this? If they can produce a contract, if you think they can produce a contract, a written contract, where your father turned over all the rights to them, much like we're always being asked to do these days whenever we do anything, you know, then you're going to have to deal with them. Probably not. But it's really dependent on the contract. You should make use of this material. Don't you think? Be ashamed, not, be ashamed not to. Is there copyright ever <coughs> Well, copyright is life of the author plus 50 years, although if it's in the United States, Depending on when it was published, there are going to be different roles, and it's complicated. But yeah, it ends. Yes? Copyright laws are territorial. Oh, this is really working now. <coughs> I hope I was captured. Copyright laws are territorial. They only operate in the territory of the country. Even American copyright. And sometimes American companies have a hard time understanding that. But if something's happening in Canada, the infringements occurring in Canada, you're going to look at Canadian. You have to look inside the country where the transactions took effect. That's an oversimplification, and there are more complex roles of international conflicts and things like that. But generally speaking, copyright laws do not have extraterritorial effect. people who 
really did believe in fairness. So all the hand clapping they did in the end, while it cut a little bit off of what the, what the fair was, it didn't, it didn't really vindicate fair dealing the way it could have. What you have to do, if you think the teaching constitutes fair dealing, you have to explain why. And you have to, in your institutional practices, articulate that it does. One, it crosses the line, and one, it doesn't. And you need to publish those. So the fact that there's some unfortunate decision in a copyright board decision that just came out should not deter us from moving forward and, and, and thinking that institutions can take a more aggressive position on this. As to whether or not, mind you, teaching, it's hard to imagine things that go on in educational institutions that are not within the scope of research, private study, criticism, or review, broadly understood. This is why the proposal that myself and many others are putting forward to the government in terms of the current submissions is that the um, word such as be included. Fair dealing for purposes such as criticism, review, research, private study, and news reporting does not infringe copyright. In making this determination, the court can take into account the factors. By adding those two words such as, you open up that possibility a lot more. And that's what the government has been asked to do. Ideally, I'd like to see the word including classroom use teaching in the Copyright Act. But there are a lot of worthy candidates for inclusion in the Copyright Act. Computer um, researchers think encryption should be in there, security should be in there. Many artists think parody should be in there. Many teachers think teaching should be in there. Many worthy candidates for inclusion. That's why the two words such as really are better because we don't have to tra trade off against go in there and ask for such as. That should cover it. The current case law probably covers it. But one of the reasons why the school boards did not do well at the copyright board <clears throat> was because they had failed to articulate their own organizational practices that were similar to the great libraries. And that's why they lost the case. Sorry to Peter Pan. That was just a... So when the CCH decision came down, some of the analysts who sided with the publisher said, okay, we've got this problem now with fair dealing. How can we get around that? And the, the worry then was that, that the database publishers would try to obtain by contract law that which they could not obtain by uh, fair dealing. In, or in other words, uh, in order to use Apex X, we're going to make the, the provision so onerous that you won't be able to do the things that you could do under fair dealing. Is, is that a legitimate concern today? Oh, it's a huge concern today. It's a huge concern today. And anybody who's attempted to negotiate a contract in a library understands what the what depths the publishing industry will go to to strip users of their lawful rights that they have under law. Probably a bigger problem in the United States than it is, than it is here, but it's a huge problem. A uh, proposed solution to that should be that you can only waive so many of your statutory rights. Um, the Copyright Act has in it from time to time an indication that something is a default rule that you can contract out of. For example, Section 13. Parliament knows how to use the words unless otherwise provided by contract. I would make the argument that when they don't use those words, they've made a choice not to use those words. And therefore, they are saying that this is not just a default rule that you can contract out of. Especially in light of the Supreme Court's characterization of fair dealing as a substantive user's right. They haven't come back and given meaning to what they mean by right yet in as much detail as they could. But I think a strong argument could be made that many of these contracts could be challenged. And I think it's really um, incumbent on our institutions to take more aggressive positions with um, the vendors. I know that our institutions are capable of taking tough stands at the bargaining table. 
when they wish to do so. And it's, it's time to see some of that resolve when it comes to dealing with uh, large vendors. But that's a great question. M might be that we need a little more clarity in the act. There's a limit on fair dealing when it comes to converting from one format to another, say so a print journal article to uh, electronic and making that available online to students. Remember that fair dealing is not absolutely free dealing. You still have to go through the criteria and explain based on all those six criteria where it's fair. So it really depends on what you're doing. If you're taking other people's materials from one, copyrighted materials from one format, putting them in another format, and uploading them to the internet where anybody in the world can get them, it's going way beyond fair dealing. Even under my view. Even when that's there. Um, if, you're, if you're then password protecting it, so only students in a particular class can get to it. No, I think that's very different. So it really depends on circumstances. And if you're looking for the answer as to where you draw that specific line, I'm just going to throw it back at you and say, you draw that line. But you articulate where that line should be based on your practices, and you put it out there and you're going to have a much better chance of that being accepted. So you, you, you always want to try to limit. If it's for students in a class, there are all sorts of technologies that you can use to limit the distribution. It would, be, it would be limited only to, not to students in a particular class, but to any students. But nobody outside the university can Okay, well, as you start to expand the group of people that can get access to it, you start to run into bigger security problems, implementation problems, and that has to be worked out. Yeah. That's why we need more carefully articulated institutional policies that are drafted together with people who are on the user end.